Good evening, and welcome to the October 25th, 2022 meeting of the Public Works Committee. I now call this meeting to order. Please be advised that FATV is conducting an audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. I ask that anyone else in the audience who is recording this meeting to please identify themselves for the record now by standing and stating their name and address. Seeing no one, at this time I ask that all electronic devices be placed in silent mode. I'm Councillor Schultz and I'm chairing this meeting for Councillor Fleming who is to my left. I'm joined by Councillors Boschman and Squalia today. So uh, let's move on to the agenda. First item on the agenda is the uh, to vote to approve the minutes from the previous meeting, uh, September 27, 2022. So I have a motion. Make a motion. Will you set the minutes of the previous meeting? Second. And we'll take that by unanimous consent if I don't see any uh, issue with that. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, we have the uh, DPW updates, and we have uh, DPW Commissioner Nick Erickson here to give us the update. Thank you, Councillor Schultz. Um, so I just want to go through division by division and give a little update of where we're, where we're at with various projects. Um, we're nearing the end of the construction season, but obviously continuing with design work. So on the water division side, um, we're underway with the Boulder Drive water main project. Um, Weston and Sampson's currently designing that. We're planning to bid that out this winter and go to construction next spring and summer. Um, so that's about it for the water division. We had a water main break on Saturday on Exeter Street. Um, and unfortunately, a, a large number of the water division staff right now is out with COVID. So it's, it's challenging for sure, especially you know, two years after the pandemic started, we're still dealing with this stuff. So it's, it's tough. Um, on the wastewater division side, we've got J.A. Polito and Sons wrapping up their combined sewer separation project um, that's kind of focused in on Paul's ward. Um, we're gonna be doing some, some paving as uh, part of that contract to fix some of the streets that were heavily impacted. Aside from Clarendon Street, which we all know we're paving, that's gonna happen in the spring. Um, we're also looking at Nashua Street, Walnut Street, Payson Street, Birch Passway, and Providence Street. Um, so those are being costed out right now by Polito and their subcontractor Amarello, and we anticipate to get started on those within another week or two. Could you please repeat that list one more time? Sure. Nashua Street, Walnut Street, Payson Street, Birch Passway, and Providence Street. Those Providence? Are Providence Street. And those are all streets that have been heavily impacted by the combined sewer separation work. So this is essentially a two inch mill and fill to get those roads back to, to a somewhat drivable condition. And so that's for this now or next year? Prior, prior to the winter, so now, oh. yeah. That's mostly Ward 1 uh, streets, correct? Yes. Oh, can I speak? You, you want to ask a question? Yeah, I'm going to ask a question. You don't mind, do you? No, go ahead. A question for you. Why not going curb to curb? You're only going the patch where we, they dug up in the main road? No, two inch curb to curb. Two inch curb to curb? Yep. Is that coming out of the water department budget? It's coming out of the, the wastewater. Wastewater division. Part of it's coming out of wastewater division. Part of it's coming out of chapter 90. Uh, but all of it's running through that contract with J.A. Polito and Sons. Uh, I won't. Uh, we're going to have a. We're going to be having a meeting, right, on this. The water rates raising up this year. Is it going to be this year? So we're we're going through a rate study right now for water and sewer, um, and once we're done with that rate study, we'll be looking at likely looking at rate increases for water and sewer. Yes. But are we going to have a meeting as a full council or uh, on the finance committee? You're going to come in front of us to explain the water rates again, like you did previous years? Yeah, it'll, it'll be much like previous years. We'll probably have um, small breakout sessions with, with city councilors to kind of prep them for what's coming and then do a presentation to the full council and whatnot. Um, I believe that's the same approach that John uh, DeLine and Jeff Murawski both used with the two um, rate increases for their respective divisions a few years ago. Okay, because the only thing I want to mention to you, I, I'll wait, I, I, I won't say too much about this right now, but I will wait to when we have a full council meeting, we have a rate study, 
and we have you guys come in front of us. I don't believe that my water bill should be paying curb to curb. I believe they should be doing like Unito does. If you, if you dig a hole in the center of the road, you patch the center of the road, and everything stays the same. Well, two things. So first, it's coming out of the wastewater enterprise fund, not water right. enterprise well, I mean, fund. So it's, enter it's, yeah, it's the sewer I mean. bills. Um, and the problem is, is when you when you try to have a contractor do permanent trench patching on a road that's already pretty far gone, it's it's a nearly impossible task to get it right. It always ends up very poorly, and then the trench settles over time, which is what we're seeing in those neighborhoods. Clarence. It's what we're seeing on Clarendon Street. It's what we're seeing on Water Street. So, in my opinion, the the two inch mill and fill that we're doing here is uh, what should be a necessary step in the restoration requirements for the water and wastewater divisions. It's not something we've done in the past, and look where it's gotten us. We have miles and miles of roads that have trenches all over them. They're falling apart. Some of the trenches are heaving. Some of them are sinking. It just, it's a bad situation. I think it's better to properly restore a road after it's dug up, assuming that you know, all the utilities are done and we're not digging up a fresh, freshly paved road within a year or two. I think it's an appropriate step to make sure that uh, trenches are restored the right way, and in my opinion, that's the right way to do it. So if, if there's a road that's in fairly good condition and a permanent trench patch, you know, just the trench is a good solution, we'll go that route to make sure that we're not friv frivolously spending money. But in the case of these five streets that I just listed, they're in, in really, really rough shape. There's other streets that were impacted by this project that probably should receive the same treatment, but we have to balance funds that we have with the, the, the most outstanding needs. I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Erickson, uh, when is that rate study going to be completed? Do you have any idea? Um, we're anticipating wrapping it up sometime this winter. Um, the goal would be to to try to go before City Council come um, like late late winter, early spring, okay. um, unless there's any other, other unforeseen obstacles. Now, my question, the only reason why I'm bringing this up, Mr. Commissioner, is this. Once our rates are never going down, the Aren't rates are never going to go down. They're going to stay the same or they're going up. What's that? Uh, Council Bushman, we, we, we've got to move on. We've got, we've got a limited amount of time, and we, we don't, we've got to get through these updates uh, from Commissioner Erickson. So it, maybe right. if you could talk offline to Commissioner Erickson about that. Well, yeah, Councilor Bushman, we, we can talk right. further about this. All right. Um, and it, really what it comes down to is just making sure that when a road is dug up by water or sewer or whomever it is, the appropriate repairs put in place afterwards so, so residents aren't left with with shoddy repairs basically we want to make sure that 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 stops happening in the future okay five streets on one one um so also on the wastewater side um we're undergoing the combined sewer separation design for um what we call the cso 10 area which is um like the northwest area of main street from ashburn M hill road um to approximately mechanic street um so that's that's going to be the next project that goes out to bid we're in design right now with that. Um, we're anticipating bidding it out in the springtime for an, uh, an early spring uh, construction, essentially. Um, and then following that, we'll go into design for the rest of the downtown area, which is kind of the, the northeast section of the downtown from Mechanic Street to, um, I want to say, Blossom Street. Um, so that's, that's further down the line, but um, still under, you know, about to undergo design now. Um, on the park side, um, I know that we just recently introduced the new recreation director to city council. Um, he's been here for about three weeks now and he's been doing a fantastic job. So hopefully you've all gotten a chance to meet him and talk to him. And if not, hopefully you have a chance in the near future. Um, I think he's gonna be a great addition to uh, the DPW staff. So we're looking forward to working with him. Um, on the park side, we're cleaning up, getting ready for winter. Um, there's not a, a whole lot beyond that happening right now. Um, on the cemetery side, we're wrapping up the Forest Hill Cemetery expansion project. So as you've all seen across from Memorial Middle School, we're expanding Forest Hill Cemetery to add about 700 graves. That should get us another five years or so um, at the Forest Hill Cemetery in its current state. So after the um, capacity there is maxed out, we'll have to look at other areas to expand. And I think the primary uh, site right now is across Electric Ave, um, very near the, the existing cemetery. Um, 
And then on the engineering side, um, you know, we continue with the day-to-day -day and we're working on finalizing that paving contract still and getting it out to bid. Clarendon Street and Industrial are going to be the first on the agenda next year. So that's, that's where we're, everything's at right now. Make a motion when you set. I have a couple questions. Um, the, uh, what's the status of the Lunenburg Street um, wastewater project of combined sewer? Um, I remember that was a couple of years ago. Did, did we finish that? Or, or I, from my memory, we were doing the neighborhood around Lunenburg Street to John Fitch, and then MassDOT was going to pave Lunenburg? Order? not on the agenda yeah it's kind of well yeah I guess it could be a point of order happy to answer can you can you answer that yeah so the 4d prod 4d combined sewer separation project focused on that that whole neighborhood um, right around Lunenburg Street John Fitch Highway um, Ray Ave Shelley Ave down towards Summer Street so that was done in 2016 um, there's still six combination manholes on Lunenburg Street that need to be separated that's within the DOT uh, jurisdiction of, of Lunenburg Street and we're working with DOT on how exactly to do that right now because there's a drain line also on Lunenburg Street that's undersized so in order to separate those combination manholes out we'd be sending more um, flow theoretically to the the drain side and DOT doesn't necessarily want that because that in influences their already undersized drain line so we're working with them on a, a strategy to address that we're doing some flow metering on Townsend Street to figure out if we can redirect some flow at the Bautel Street intersection down towards Townsend Street, um, and that's still very much in the works. Um, we did recently um, repave a section of Lunenburg Street that's on the city's jurisdiction, or under the city's jurisdiction, um, to fix an area of pavement that was damaged by that water main break, right out in front of Slatteries. Yeah. Yeah. I complain about that. But at this point, um, that whole area has been separated, so there's no other combined sewer work planned, sewer separation work planned for that area aside from those six combination manholes on Lunenburg Street. And where are we are with the, the street light backlog? Um, the contractor's been working pretty diligently oh, through yeah. the list. I think one of the issues right now is just getting materials. So street light poles are on back order, ornamental street light poles are on back order, and we're looking at like anywhere from one to six months, depending on what part it is that we're waiting for. Maybe a year, okay. Mm. All right, let's, let's move on. I, I did want to make a comment on the expansion of Forest Hill Cemetery. I've heard nothing but positive uh, comments on the wall and that whole expansion project. So I will, will <laughs> give, uh, give that uh, point of order. Right? And that, that should be um, <laughs> hydro-seeded next week? We're next planning? week. Next week, next week we're hydro-seeding. Try, try to get it uh, seeded at least before the winter hits so that it comes back um, and grows in nicely in the springtime. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Erickson. We'll move on to our petition items. The first item is 258.22. It's uh, Councilor Sam Squalier and Bernie Schultz on behalf of Janet Rivera to remedy the sidewalk area in front of 367 Water Street per the following. Remove the existing tree that is causing significant sidewalk heaving. Repair the sidewalk to allow for accessible access. Repoint the mortar joints on the granite block wall in that area. And that was referred from City Council on October 18, 2022. Uh, and we have um, the resident. We here. have the resident here. Would you like to speak? Anybody like to speak on that? If you would, you could approach the podium and. I'm actually a member. I'm intimidated. Yes, you, you may speak. Just just give give us your name and uh, your address. And, oh. and the town you live in. My name is Roxana Mayes. I live in 102 Almont Road here in Fitchburg, okay. um, and I'm related to Janet Rivera, who lives in 367 Water Street. Okay. I apologize if I'm blushing. I'm a little shy. I'm not a public speaker. That's okay. <laughs> um, but I, I just wanted to advocate for her today. Um, she was firmly asking for the uh, tree to be removed for quite some time, um, not only because it's a high pedestrian area and it's causing folks to kind of step out into the road because of the unevenness of the um, sidewalk. Uh, we've seen folks that, um, of course, bicycle riders, but folks with strollers and so forth, um, going out into the road, which is a high, heavy traffic area, um, not very safe. Um, and then in addition to the retaining wall in front of her house has had some significant dam damage throughout the years. Um, and it's because of the roots of the tree, to our understanding. Um, and so, you know, because of that, that's the, the main reason why she's asking for it to be removed, um, in addition to, you know, the 
uh, sidewalk needing obvious repairs itself. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, did you get a chance to look at uh, Yes, I did. Um, as in some separation with Stony Brook, we can remove the tree is a live tree and a healthy tree, so it shouldn't be removed. But we can do remove the existing sidewalk and pave up and over. Rather than removing the tree itself. Correct. What yes. about the wall? Did you the wall, the wall itself is owned by the homeowner? It's a private wall. Okay. That was my question whether it was owned by the homeowner or the or the city. Council Boschman. If the tree is damaging the wall, wouldn't that be our responsibility? I don't. Yeah, I mean, really the wall is on private property. We're not supposed to spend public funds on private property. I mean, it's unfortunate that the trees damage the wall. Um, I, I, I can't argue that, but I think the issue is that the wall is owned by the property owner and expecting the city to fix a privately owned wall, um, I, I, I just have a t hard time with that. I, I apologize to intervene. The request is not to fix the retaining wall. It's yeah. just to remove the tree so she can be able to be a responsible owner and fix her own retaining wall out of her own funds. It just does, it doesn't make sense for her to pay for that and then it have further damage and have to repair it once again. So if the tree were to re be removed, then it would just, you know, it would rectify her being able to move forward and fix her retaining wall herself. So it, okay. in actuality, it's not the retaining wall that's being requested, it's just the tree to be removed. So the sidewalk can be fixed, and then once she has the funding to fix the wall, um, it would make sense to be able to fix the wall without the tree further damaging, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Council of Fleming. So if I'm understanding this right, you're not going to remove the tree? Correct. You're just going, are you going to trim the tree? To? The tree's been trimmed two years ago. Oh, okay. And, and then you're just going to put a new sidewalk. So the, the growing of the tree, the roots, are they going to continue to cause a problem for the retaining wall? I mean, uh, unless the tree's removed, the, the roots are going to continue to grow, cause issues with whatever sidewalk fix is done to kind of bridge the, the existing root ball, um, probably continue to impact the, the wall as well. I think Gary's point is just that the tree's a live tree, it's a healthy tree. Um, typically we don't remove live healthy trees that are within the right of way. Obviously this is an extenuating, extenuating circumstance, so um, I'd leave it to the committee to, to make the decision really. Make a motion, we cut down the tree. Do I hear a second? Second, and I'd like to speak on that motion. Okay, Councilor Squally. The, um, the distance between the tree and the wall, I don't think, is, is handicap accessible. I haven't measured it myself, but we need 36 inches of clear path for handicap accessibility. So I'm not sure what the distance between the, the tree and the wall is, but we could right. measure well, it. There's many trees within the city that don't give you the 36 inches. Yeah. So unless you remove them, it doesn't have to become ADA compliant. I agree with Councilor Boschman on, the, on his uh, idea to remove the tree. We're going we're gonna to pave over, and then we're going to be fixing it at some future point. So I don't, don't agree with that. I, I think we should remove the tree, and then they can, they can fix their wall, and uh, you know, we'll be done with it. It's a shame that we have to take down a healthy tree, but sometimes you have to if it's, if it's uh, causing damage to property. Council Squire. I'm thought. a tree hugger too, and I don't like taking trees down. But what about the greening the Gateway Cities um, program? Is there an opportunity to remove that tree and replace it with a tree that is more appropriate, that doesn't in a in a in the correct box that won't further damage a sidewalk in the future? I don't think there's enough room to put the box in with the tree, and to make it ADA compliant. Right. So I, I guess the concern is that when we touch it, whatever we put back has to be ADA compliant. So if we're putting back a tree. I don't know, I, I think Gary's right. I don't think we have the room to maintain that 36 inch plus install the tree plus leave enough um, exposed dirt for water and whatnot to get down in there and keep the tree watered and whatnot. Um, and one other thing I, I will mention is that I talked with Tom Skrowski prior to him leaving and going to Revere, but I think that corridor of Water Street is kind of on community development's agenda for some sort of a, a future grant funding application. And that would be um, not just this one area, but it would be the whole corridor and it would be 
taking care of the trees that are overgrowing the sidewalks, fixing the sidewalks, fixing the lighting, fixing um, you know all the the issues with that corridor. So that's on like a I, I don't have an exact time frame, but I'd say like a, a five year time frame on, within which we'll look to find grant money to do something there. Um, and obviously, this is just one tree out of probably. 10 or 15 along that stretch there that have very similar issues with causing sidewalk buckling and all that. Okay, Councilor Fleming on the motion. So I'm just curious, um, I, I'm not a fan of cutting trees, but where it's causing these people damage to their property. But do we open a Pandora's box when we start cutting trees because they're damaging people's property. Will we, will, will, will we have to start cutting down all the trees that may be well, damaging on people? We're, we're going to call point of order on that, too. Yeah, We've got a motion on the floor. We have a motion on the floor. Yeah. Uh, th now, the, the motion, we already have the petition. And, uh, Councilor Squalia, did you want to amend the petition to, uh, to uh, remove the repointing of the mortar joints on the, on the granite block wall and just leave it as uh, remove the existing tree and repair, repairing the sidewalk? Um, yes, I would move that motion to amend to strike, report the mortar joints. Councilor Boschman, would you like to second that motion? I'll second it. Okay. I think we should have a vote on the, uh, on the motion, on the amendment first. Which is to? To take out the, the wall part because they're just asking for the tree to be removed yeah. and the and uh, sidewalk the to be repaired. And we don't yeah. own the wall. So. Uh, the amendment is just to take out the, 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 the wall. And leave the tree in there. Okay. Okay. So we'll have a we'll have a, a roll call vote, I guess, on that. Uh, Councilor Fleming. Yes. Councilor yep. Squire. I. Yes. And I and I uh, concur. So it's a four to zero uh, to amend. Amend Councilor Boschman's motion. Motion. Yeah. And so now we have Councilor Boschman's motion that has been amended. Okay. So to we'll, remove the tree and repair the sidewalk. And so we'll have a, a roll call vote on that. And I. Councilor Fleming? That's a tough one. I'm going to say no. Okay. Councilor Squalia? Aye. Councilor Boschman? Aye. And I, I say aye, so it's three to one that, that we remove the tree and uh, cut the tree down. Cut the tree down and repair the sidewalk. Okay. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, petition 25922. Councilor Sam Squire suggested amendments to the Main Street Boulder Drive layout. And that was referred from City Council on October 18th, 2022. Uh, so we'll have uh, Councilor Squire speak to your amendments uh, this time. Sure. Uh, so it's all written out, you know, here. And um, some of these were my suggestions, but most of them were from the community. Uh, this, the stop sign at the end of the eastern end of Boulder Drive, um, there used to be a yield sign because there is, it, it enters into its own lane. And I don't know why a stop sign was added in the new design, but it's still entering into its own lane. And, uh, you know, Main Street continues in a separate lane. So in order for Main Street to get into the lane Boulder Drive turns right onto, it actually needs to change lanes. So it doesn't make sense that there is a stop sign there. Um, do we want to go through these? Well, I think we're going to go through them one at a time, and okay. we'll, we'll we'll vote on them one at a time. Then we can vote on the whole the whole package of amendments after that. We've got Councilor Van Hasinger here as well, so we're going to start with number one, Councilor Van Hasinger, and it reads: uh, remove the st remove the stop sign at the eastern end of Boulder Drive. This lane enters Main Street with its own dedicated lane. Main Street traffic has to merge into the right lane. Previously, this traffic pattern was significantly similar, and no stop sign was required. You, have a co you had a comment on number one. I, I do, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. As um, most of these changes take place in my ward and Ward 4, this one is actually in Councilor Fleming's ward next door. But uh, I was also a member of the planning board when these um, redesigns went through and were approved, so I can offer some comment there. Uh, my comment here is that it, historically there have been times when there's been no stop sign. There have been times when there has been a stop sign there. There's been times when there's been a yield sign. And I don't know why it's changed over time. But I, I would recommend that um, if the stop sign is removed, some additional marking is done to, to clearly identify the lanes. 
because there are you know two lines of traffic coming together at right before a light where traffic is moving back and forth depending if they want to go straight or go left on the north street and i just want to avoid the um creation of a, a dangerous situation where cars are coming up at speed and moving over to try to maneuver around other cars and then are you know, yeah. coming into other traffic. I, I actually agree speed. with the stop sign. I think it's a good addition because I, I traveled that particular lane quite a bit, and people don't always yield there. And they just pull right into in traffic into that lane. So I'm not in favor of removing that stop sign. But uh, we'll let someone else on this committee speak as well. Does Anyone the, else? Um, DPW Commissioner have? DPW Commissioner. So um, thank you. Uh, most recently, there was a stop sign there prior to um, the two-way drive, two-way Boulder Drive conversion. Um, prior to that, there was a yield sign. I think prior to that, there might have been a stop sign. So it has gone back and forth, like Councillor uh, Van Hazig has suggested. Um, ultimately, uh, we constructed a design that uh, our engineering consultant prepared. Um, their name is Time Bond. Their traffic engineer stamped the project. So I have a hard time going against their traffic study and their engineering design and removing that stop sign, especially considering I've witnessed people coming from Main Street eastbound towards Summer Street completely disregard the fact that there's two lanes there with a separate lane for Boulder Drive coming onto Main Street and just switch right over into that um, right-hand lane to go towards Summer Street, um, kind of ignoring some of the traffic coming from Boulder Drive. So. Um, I don't think it's causing any inconvenience really to have the stop sign there. It takes three seconds to stop, look where you're going, and then pull out. I don't think that's causing a major inconvenience. I don't think it's causing a bit traffic back up there. Um, so I would prefer to leave the stop sign there. If the um, committee feels strongly that um, they'd like the stop sign removed, I think we should go back to Ty and Bond and ask for their input first and see what they say. I think it's a safety issue, and I think it, it increases the safety at that intersection. I really do. Council Boschman. May I point out to everybody, before we made a two-way Main Street, all your traffic was coming down Boulder Drive. Ninety-nine percent of traffic was coming down Boulder Drive. And then you just get the traffic over the bridge in uh, Blossom Street. But other than that, now you get a heck of a lot more traffic, a lot more traffic. You can see it. When it, and you can't, to be honest with you, I, I've been there, it's hard to go across to get into the lane and to go into the, so you can go up North Street. It's very hard unless you stop. Unless you want to pull out and stop all traffic. And a guy like Boschman doesn't stop. He says, heck with you. I was here first. And the guy behind you says the same thing. You, you know, so it's better to have the stop sign, I think. I, for my, I'm going to take a lot of flack from it, but for my friend, because he complained about it too, but I, I see cars going across, and it's easier for them to get across when the traffic really slows down instead of trying to merge. Okay, in my opinion. Yeah. You've made your point. Thank you. Thank you, Thank yes. you very much, sir. Any, anyone else like to comment on Amendment Number One before we take a vote? Okay. I, I, well, I do. I think we should keep it the way the engineers planned it. I wish we asked Ty, Ty and Bond. Thank you, Kevin, okay. suggested. So, uh, Councilor Fleming, how do, you, how do you vote on this uh, amendment? To keep the stop sign, so keep that would be a no vote on amendment? So one. that's a no vote. On the yes vote? A what? A no vote? A no vote. A no so vote. it's three to one. <clears throat> okay, number two is uh, add a don't block the box traffic painting and signage at the Blossom Street, Main Street intersection. This is amendment number two. Traffic blockage during rush hours in morning and afternoon can be problematic at this intersection. Traffic light timing has improved it. However, rush hour remains an issue. And we'll, we'll go to... Yeah, uh, the, the don't block the box was just kind of an, I, an idea I had. I, something needs to be improved there. Whether it's a don't block the box, I thought that would be inexpensive and effective. But I'm open to any... Suggestion. Commissioner Erickson, would you like to comment oh, and, on that? And, and, and also, has, uh, support this. yes, Council Van. Uh, so uh, I'm in support of this. I mean, this is identified as one of the areas where there is a problem with the um, 
the two-way main, but to be honest with you, this was a problem intersection before we did the conversion to two-way traffic on Main Street. It's always been a problem. And unfortunately, most of the time during the day, it, it works fine. It's just those peak traffic hours in the morning and the afternoon where traffic backs up on Main Street. It gets uh, very difficult, and it backs up on Blossom Street. And if we can do something to try to keep that open to kind of keep cars circulating, I think it would help. And maybe it won't have an effect, but it's paint. It's cheap, yeah. cheap investment. So yeah. maybe we give it a try. Okay. Also, uh, um, so I agree with Councillor Van Hazinga. Um, that intersection headed westbound on Main Street at, at uh, Water and, and Day has always been an issue, especially during peak traffic times. I remember as a kid sitting there in traffic with you know, my parents trying to get home from school, and basically the, the queue stacks up for that left turn lane over the Water Street Bridge. It blocks the turn onto Boulder Drive as, as currently configured. It blocks uh, the center lane headed westbound on Main Street. So it causes issues. I'm not sure what the real solution is there. Um, so I talked to Sergeant Boudreau a little bit about this because traffic um, and, and, you know, this stuff is, is kind of his, his jurisdiction. So um, he brought up the issue of enforcement too. So say we do paint this on the ground. We had a sign. Um, they do this in, I think it's Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They've got don't block the box everywhere and the signs and it seems to work there. But his issue is enforcement. So how, do you, how does the, the PD enforce something like that when we put it on the ground and we add the signs? Because um, by the time an officer is called to the site, theoretically the traffic light's already turned green and the, the queue is cleared and there, there's no issue there. So um, his, his main point is that there's no real way to enforce it. So yes, we can put it on the ground and we can hope people listen to it, but we know that people don't pay attention to signs anyways. We know people don't follow paint on the ground you know, a lot of times I see people crossing double yellow center lines all the time. Um, I see people not paying attention to stop bars. I see people not stopping at stop signs. I see people run red lights. So um, these are all, all issues, and I, I'm not sure that spending the money on painting the ground in this one location every year and keeping up with it year over year is really going to be worthwhile. I mean, we could try it and see if it helps, and if it doesn't, not, not do it again. In right. following years, that, that, right? We won't, we won't keep it up if, the, if it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not. It's not. The other question is, you know, how how big do we make this box? Is it the entire width of Main Street from um, the double yellow center line all the way over to the curb? Um, I think that might be what it has to be, just to avoid everyone stopping in that little, you know, twelve foot zone or so. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, so just to summarize, it's it's a maintenance issue for DPW long term. Um, so if, if it doesn't actually work, then, you know, it, it's a, a kind of a, a futile, futile effort um, and potentially a waste of money. And then how do we enforce it? You know, police department's not going to be able to, to respond to a call to, you know, get someone that's blocking the box, you know. So leave it up to the, the committee to decide. To decide. Council Boschman. I understand what Andy says. But Andy ain't it's not counting the fact that we got a two-way Main Street now. And I keep on telling you the problem that we're having there is those three or four parking spaces on the right side where cars can't get by. So we'll, we'll get I, to I that. I can't see spending my money to put a box on a, a painted box yeah, when you get, you know, the parking area on the right side, the cars can't get by. And when you can't get by, you block traffic. So, and, and when you can't get by, Everybody backs up. You can't get to the right to make a right turn. You have to eliminate those three parking spaces. And that's what, if you want to solve the problem, that, but I'm not paying a couple of thousand dollars every year to go and pay in a box when you know the problem's right there. Council so you can come by. Thank you. Um, just a comment. Um, you know, just because the police can't respond to something doesn't mean that's something that we shouldn't even try. I mean, police can't respond to they turned right on red, or fireworks, or any other number of laws and ordinances. But they didn't stop in the crosswalk, which I've heard a lot right. lately. Right. Uh, police That's can't true. respond to that. But right. there's, there's still good reason to have these things yeah. you know, in, in effect, because I think a majority of people follow the signage. I get complaints about no turn on red, but I see a majority of people stop. Follow that, yeah. So um, just to make that comment. Um, and to the comment of the, the parking on the right, that's a loading zone, and it's needed for 
um, the Chinese food recipes. That, that's that's coming up. It's coming up. further in the, it's further in the amendments. Um, Council Van Hazing, would you like to make one more comment? The voting zone on the that right. Council Scholar is referring to is on the other side of if the street. It's on, on the other side of the street. Councilor Bosham is referring to the three spaces in front of Tacos, Tequilas, and the former uh, Saint Anne. Uh, uh, oh, I thought he was talking okay. about the other ones. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Councilor Fleming, did you want to weigh in on this? Uh, no. Okay. Let's take a vote on, uh, on amendment number two then. Uh, so the uh, amendment is to uh, paint the box. Uh, don't block the box. Uh, paint it on the, and, and I think uh, Commissioner Erickson had a good recommendation. We can try it one year, but if it doesn't work, if it doesn't seem to be having any effect, we just don't continue it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Councilor Fleming, how do you vote on uh, painting the? Uh, we can try it. We can try it. So that's a yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. What are we going to do about the parking? Well, that's, that's another not issue. That's not on the. That's not an amendment. We, we can talk about that another time. I say no. You say no. I say yes. So it's three to one. Yes. Seems like we get consensus tonight. Three to one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amendment number three. Uh, make both lanes on Main headed east at Day Street and Water Street straight. Left lane should be left alternate. Adjust light configuration as required. It says allowing two lanes to go straight and have better signage will help move traffic through the intersection and alleviate the boulder drive blockages. Councilor Van Hazinger. I don't, did Councilor Scully want to introduce it first? Did you, did oh, you want to? Yep, this was a suggestion from the community on something that we could do to move the traffic along. Um, I do turn, I do make that left turn fairly often, but there is a significant amount of traffic that is not turning left compared to turning, to, compared to going straight or turning right. So it, it, it I felt like it was worthy of discussion. So I, I appreciate the intent in looking at opportunities to try to increase the flow through that intersection. I think part of the problem is if you're allowing two lanes of traffic to go straight into the intersection, it appears that there's only enough width for one to come out. So that creates that they have cars have to merge within the distance of the intersection. Which that's never a good thing. No, <laughs> I don't think that's a safe um, traffic arrangement. Yeah. So I appreciate the opportunity, but or the the idea the, to look at it, but I'm not sure that it's physically possible to do safely. Commissioner Erickson, did you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah. So this one, Sergeant Boudreau and I have have gone out. Um, and observed and I think come up with a configuration that's slightly different than what's being recommended here, but also makes some significant improvements. So our proposal is to modify this number three um, such that we have one single lane that's both a, a straight and a left turn lane. So someone can either go straight or take the left on today. Um, eliminate the second lane completely, which allows room for cars to go by the straight through lane on the right and turn over the Water Street Bridge, but also at the same time eliminating one of those parking spaces in front of Tacos Tequila so that it allows a little bit of extra room. So that would be the space closest to the intersection um, or furthest east, I guess, um, out in front of the, the old Santander built building. So um, this is something we can do relatively easy with paint. It's, it's nothing that requires us to build a new island or anything like that. And then if it is successful, we could actually put in an island that reflects that configuration, or we could wait until the Water Street Bridges project by MassDOT is completed and ask them to work that reconfiguration into the design. If we do that, I don't think there's going to need to be many tweaks made outside of just the paint. I don't think we'll need to change the light timing. I don't think we'll need to change the um, configuration other than just painting it on the ground. Just a quick question. So it would it would be a single lane for straight ahead and left turn on today, um, and then eliminating the second lane, and basically allowing that space for cars to come down Main Street or out of Blossom onto Main Street and take the right over the Water Street. Okay, so create a right only lane and then a straight or left lane. Correct. Okay, so would the median the island have to be brought out a little bit? I think we can do it with paint. Okay. If, if it's successful, I think we could modify the islands to, to make it more permanent, but I think that might be a good way to, to try it, see if it works, and then if necessary, make the, the larger investment there. And then we'd also eliminate one of the three parking spots out in front of Tacos Tequila to allow a little bit extra room for that right turn only lane. So that, that would be um, my suggestion. Like I said, I, I talked with Sergeant Boudreau. 
we went out to the site, we watched, we studied this, um, and, and we think this is a viable option. Are any of those spaces handicapped? There's one handicapped space. Um, so the issue right now is that there's no ADA ramp out there, and we're taking a hard look at all of the um, handicapped spaces throughout the Main Street corridor. You really need an ADA ramp to allow the, vehicle, the um, wheelchairs onto the sidewalk. So if we maintain an, a, a, a handicapped spot there, we need to install an ADA ramp somewhere, which we can certainly do. Mm -hmm. um, but the, right now, the, the thought would be to eliminate the, the handicapped spot until that ramp is constructed. But one will be replaced because now using handicapped spots, I understand <laughs> how important they are. So, yeah. The issue is we want those ADA ramps to allow the wheelchairs up onto the sidewalk so that wheelchairs don't have to go all the way around the long way to whatever the nearest ramp is. Yeah. And sometimes that, that path in order to get to the nearest ramp puts you out in the middle of a travel lane. So like out in front of City Hall right over here, for example, there was a handicap, there were a few handicap spots on that that far western side, mm -hmm. but there's no ADA ramp except for out in front of City Hall. So the path of a wheelchair to get into that ramp would be to go out into the travel <laughs> lane, which is a, a dangerous path for a, a, a person in a wheelchair to take. So right now we've removed those handicap signs um, until we're able to, uh, to put in an ADA ramp yeah. there. So we're looking at and doing that it. That won't be years down the road, right? That would be sort of immediately? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, out in front of City Hall, that's, that's short term. We're planning on doing that either late this fall or early next spring. Um, but this over in front of the, the Tacos Tequila uh, building, that would probably be a, a next spring thing. All right. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, Council Squad, would you like to amend the uh, amendment to uh, Commissioner Erickson and yeah. Sergeant Boudreaux's? Uh, that that seems that well, sounds to work great. Um, should should um, let, let Councilor Van Hassen speak? Uh, I, I just had a comment on the handicap space, and I would want to put out or remind everybody that not everybody who uses a handicap space is in a wheelchair. That there are people like Councilor Kramer who may be on crutches or just simply can't walk far. Or um, also, if a wheelchair van that has a side loading ramp is at that, they can load, unload directly onto the sidewalk if they're using for frequent the businesses there. So I think there still is advantage to having an accessible space, especially where parking at the far side of the building involves coming up a very steep grade. Um, other, the parking lot is a great distance um, from this area. So I, I think to uh, people who need handicapped access or desire handicapped access to, to go to Tacos Tequila or whatever businesses are in those establishments would, would still appreciate it, even if the, the ramp access isn't perfect. Could, could we keep that uh, handicap accessible parking spot? And, and so that unfortunately is not my jurisdiction. I have to defer to Sergeant Boudreau and, and FPD on that. Okay. Um, they determine where the handicap spaces get placed. Okay, so we, that, that would be a, an issue for pub, the Public Safety Committee. Correct, to, yeah. To, to, yeah, and to, I would also not want to um, add that into the agenda because it's nothing like that. The removal of parking spaces is not necessarily mentioned. Right. So I would like to amend to um, and amend number three to um, Commissioner Erickson's suggestion to make one single combined straight and left lane. Second. Is that going to work without removing a parking space, though, Commissioner Erickson? Um, I'll have to look at it with Sergeant Boudreau. Um, if it does require moving a parking space and there's a desire to keep the handicap space and Sergeant Boudreau is okay with it, we could eliminate one of the non-handicap spaces out there. That, so we have some flexibility. Sense, I, think. I think we could, with, for the purposes of this um, agenda item, we could approve it pending the determination by Sergeant Boudreau which, hand, which spot to remove, whether it's the handicap or the, the standard space. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Let's have a have a vote on that, Councilor Fleming. Uh, so yes. Yes to the amendment. Yes. Yes, yes. Councilor Boschman. Yep. Yes, and I, I vote yes to, to the new uh, arrangement. Okay, moving on. Change number four is change the ordinance for the loading zone in front of the Fitchburg J Tiki Tiki three. Councilor Schultz, just Main point Street to be loading zone Monday through point Saturday. Point order on that, Councilor Schultz. Um, so you voted on modifying the um, petition, now you need to vote on approving oh, the okay. modified petition. Sorry, thank you for the correction. And so we need a vote, that's a so no four vote. vote on the amendment, and now we need a vote on the... Uh, the motion, we vote on the amendment. Okay. Motion. And how do we vote on that, Council? Yes. 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 
Yes, yes, and yes. So it's four on the amendment. Okay, thank you, Com Commissioner Erickson, for the correction. And now we'll move on to uh, amendment number four. So the, the issue with the, the, the loading zone in front of uh, Tiki Tiki is that there's, the main issue is there's some um, misunderstanding as to the interpretation of the ordinance. Uh, Sergeant Boudros has written me and told me that um, after 4 p.m. anyone can park there for as long as they want. And parking clerk um, in Cervantes ha interprets it such that um, the af you know there's 15 minutes uh, that you can park there after 4 p.m. Uh, only for 15 minutes, but during 8 to 4 you can park there for 30 minutes. So I figured to just to clarify, we would make it 8 to 11 p.m. there. But as Councillor um, Van Hasinga notes, that um, he interprets it the way that um, the parking clerk. Answer Fante's interprets it, correct? Sure. Okay. So, whatever. Council Van Hazen. So, so the, the, the way loading zones, the restrictions for loading zones are defined for the entire city, and then loading zones are identified in different parts of the city. So, the way the lo a loading zone works is that any car can park in a loading zone any time of day for up to 15 minutes. If they are actively loading or unloading, they can park there for longer with the exception of eight to four, which that active loading time could only be half an hour. So if this restriction isn't set just for this location, it's set for the entire city, so you'd have to change how the city code handles parking ordinances to, to separate this spot versus others. But it is a, a matter of enforcement. And um, I have had some discussions with Councillor Boudreau, and he actually went back and did some digging into the code to find this actual definition of it and realized that he had been interpreting it um, incorrectly. So he has talked to um, the, the patrol officers to be aware of how the loading zones work and to keep an eye on this problem area specifically. Part of the tough part is that the parking attendants or the parking enforcement officers are on duty during the daytime, but then go home at the end of the day and they're not patrolling Main Street because they're, they keep an eye on parking on Main Street. Does anyone who's gotten a ticket downtown know that they, they keep on top of things? So p patrol officers have to be able to, to notify, you know, catalog, you know, time a car has been there. In, requires multiple trips and there's other things going. So it's a little more harder, but he has talked to the patrol officers for, to, to keep an eye out for this type of problem in this location. Perfect. Good. Isn't the uh, traffic, the city correct traffic guy to take care of that problem down here between eight, eight o'clock and four? Yes, correct, but does. they're only on duty eight o'clock to four. Right, I understand that. Because we have the same problem down here at the, uh, the Mexican place down there on Lonerberg Street. Zapata. Zapata, when they, we put a loading do uh, dock in there, a loading place, and the guy that was parking there all day was the, the guy that owned the restaurant. Mm -hmm. He was there all day. So what we need to do is make sure that we share the information from the Fitchburg Police Department. Maybe we can get an official communication from them on the official interpretation of the ordinance such that you know, you can park there for 15 minutes. If actively loading, you can park there for 30, uh, except between 8 and 4, and we'll put that out there, and then we don't need this petition, and we, and we instruct people, if people are parking there for longer than 15 to 30 minutes, call the Fitchburg Police Department. Yeah. I, I think Councilor Scully is right. It's a combination of education and enforcement. Yeah, so you can do what they can to enforce, but we can also educate property owners mm -hmm or identify areas where this is a problem and try to, to educate the people about how a loading zone works and okay. how to properly use it. Mm -hmm. oh. Mary Jo. Yes, uh, Mary Jo. I wanted to make, and this has to do with, excuse me, sorry. Um, businesses share the loading zones under the new arrangement now. So just because a loading zone is in front of a pair of businesses doesn't mean that others on the other side of the street aren't also reliant on it because the south side of Main Street no longer has loading zones. So I just wanted to make that point, whether it's El Bohio, whether it's Trist, you know, there, a loading zone may be on the north side and we may be thinking of those two north side businesses and how uh, their needs are, but it's actually shared. So it's just something to keep in mind when we do the education, all businesses need to be a part of that. Thank you, Mary Jo. Okay, so I'm going to uh, vote this down. Well, we're going to so we we'll, we'll have a vote. That we want to you want to propose a leave to withdraw on this amendment. Yes, okay. leave, I move leave to withdraw. And do we have a second? Second. 
Second. I have one question. Can I ask one question, sir? One question on the motion? On the motion. On the, you're going to tell the policeman, by the time the policeman gets a phone call, by the time they get, get there, it could be 45 minutes later and the car can be gone. Then if it's yeah. got a problem, you know it's not I mean? a problem. That's, yeah, then it's not a problem they're gone. Right, 45 <laughs> minutes? I mean, you would say 15, 20, half an hour. The problem is people are parking there. All right, let's, let's have a right. vote on this so we can move right, on. We've got, we've got six it. more to go here. Okay. Uh, Councilor Fleming, how do you vote? So we should withdraw. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Councilor Squalia? Yes. Councilor Boschman? Yeah, withdraw. We'll and I vote yes. WT. Four to zero. Okay. Number five is uh, there should be a legal crosswalk added between 718 Main Street and Academy Street. There are many desirability crossings observed in front of the Pittsburgh Historical Society. And with the complicated traffic configurations of the new two-way configurations, forcing pedestrians to cross at specific locations hundreds of feet away result in pedestrians crossing wherever, whenever they can, illegally. And uh, Councillor Van Hazinger had a comment on this. Did, uh, uh, understanding the intent. Uh, Did you want to... Well, she had that, a chance that, earlier. That yeah. basically covers it. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm not opposed. I, I think it's valuable to have good crosswalks uh, that are convenient <laughs> to people using them because then they're more likely to use the crosswalks. I do caution that it's not a good idea to put crosswalks in a dangerous position because that doesn't keep people safe just because there's paint on the, the pavement. And we have a situation where two lines of traffic <laughs> are, are merging right at this area as well as another from the other direction. It's crossing one of the merges. It's just so, in, it, there's a light where it backs up. So I would just caution to really take a look at what is what can be safely done uh, and not create a, a dangerous position by putting a crosswalk in a place where it exposes people to getting hit by cars that are, are looking at cars coming from two other directions and not just the, the crosswalks. Crosswalks are dangerous as, 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 as it is. I mean, they, 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 really, they really are dangerous. Uh, you really have to watch when, you, when you're on the crosswalk. And, um, you know, I've, I've received a lot of complaints lately about that, and I know uh, Chief Martino is looking at enforcement uh, of people running, driving through crosswalks. Councilor Fleming. If I'm not mistaken, isn't there a whole process we have to go through with engineering studies in order to put a crosswalk anywhere? Because I know we're having those issues in some of the other parts of the city. So to just all of a sudden put a, a crosswalk there when there's one on either side that's accessible, you know, people just need to observe what is there, not look for a new fix. Just, but you're always going to get the people who are just going to jaywalk. It's just. Commissioner Erickson. So I think it's just a. Yeah, maybe Commissioner Erickson. Like so, so I, I agree. Um, when a, a crosswalk's proposed, we need to make sure it's safe. So there needs to be a, an, a level of engineering study done, depending on the situation. In this case, that entire intersection was redesigned and reconfigured, and the engineers that did the design made the choice to eliminate existing crosswalks there for that very reason, because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of turning movements. There's a lot of merging happening. There's a lot of people looking up at traffic lights and not necessarily at the crosswalks in front of them. They made the decision not to put the crosswalk there and to remove the one that was there. Um, so I feel very uncomfortable authorizing um, basically us to, to go against what the, the traffic engineers designed as, as part of that project. I think if, if the uh, committee feels very strongly that they want a crosswalk here, we need to go back in time to tie and bond and ask them to um, basically take another look at that and see if, if their design can support that. Um, just judging from, from what I see, I, I don't think that's, that's something that um, the current design can support. Um, you know, it's, it's a heavily congested area. You've got uh, a new traffic pattern there. You've got Boulder Drive coming onto Main Street. You've got Main Street going now across Boulder Drive onto Main Street in front of City Hall eastbound. So there's a lot going on there that wasn't going on before. And I think that was the reason why those crosswalks were taken out of there. Um, the ones up at Academy and down in front of City Hall aren't prohibit prohibitively far away and they're ADA accessible. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see a, a strong need to, to reinvent the wheel and, and put another crosswalk back here where you know, we'd be ripping up uh, new sidewalks that were just installed, new curbing, ripping up new pavement. Um, and then we'd have to, again, do a, some sort of an engineering analysis to support it. And I don't think that an, an engineering analysis will support it. 
Okay, let me, why don't we I'll, take a vote on I this? I make a motion that LTD W leave to withdraw. Leave to withdraw. Okay, so we'll have a, a vote on the motion to, to withdraw it. Councilor Fleming? Yes. Councilor Squire? Nope. Councilor yes. Bushman? And I vote yes, so it's three to one. We don't list your dad, three to one again. Okay. Okay, number six. Uh, no right on red at Putnam Street and Main Street. Traffic turning right on red at Putnam Street conflicts with pedestrian movement and signage. Councilor Van Hasinger, did you want to weigh in on that? Sure. I would just uh, point out that per Mass General Law, a car, a car turning right on red must yield to pedestrians in a crosswalk. That it's already an established rule. Um, there are many intersections throughout the city where this, where this happens. So I don't think eliminating the right turn on red is the answer. I think the answer is more enforcement and make sure people follow the rules. I agree. Councilor Squire. I, uh, this is one of the ones I shared from the community. I didn't really get it. I figured I'd put it out there. I don't know if there's any, been any uh, concern with it. Okay. So I, I talked to Sergeant Boudreaux. There hasn't been any, any reported accidents out there or reported issues. Um, obviously, the suggestion was made for a reason. However, I agree with Councillor Van Hasinga. The, the law is that cars turning right and red must yield to pedestrians. Um, there's enough visibility at this intersection um, that I don't see the need to proceed with this suggestion. Um, conversely, if we look at Water Street turning onto Bemis Road, where we have the new rail trail, we did approve a no right turn on red sign there. And I think that was for very significantly different reasons, because you have a pedestrian trail being funneled into a, a much busier corridor, I think, with lower visibility, a steep incline, and a few other um, kind of obstructions in that area. Um, so it's, it's slightly different situations. I think it's apples to oranges. Um, so we shouldn't approve this necessarily just because we approved that one. I think they're two separate cases um, and I, I don't really think it's necessary in this particular case. And, and, and there's another, uh, another issue there with, the, uh, with Cushing Street becoming a pedestrian plaza. You have a hard time getting to Main Street now because you used to be able to take Cushing Street and turn left onto Main Street. You're you're gonna you're gonna be way down the road to, to try to get back onto Main Street. So it right. uh, it, it is a it is a, a, an excellent. Uh, okay, let's have a vote on number number six. Uh, Councilor Fleming. Motion to withdraw. Yes. Well, we don't what? we don't need a motion. We can just, oh, say, we just, just say, say no. No. Okay. Well, Councilor. Um, Unless you want to you want to make Fleming gave a, motion you, to, you leave to withdraw. You want to have a motion to withdraw. Okay, you're going to second it. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Okay, so Council Fleming, how do you vote on that? Yes, oh, right? Yes, I might. <laughs> <laughs> Council Squire. Yes. Council Boschman. Yes. Can I vote yes. <laughs> I'll leave the door. I have to be re educated. Yes. It's an L T W. Okay, number seven is make Newton Place one way from Maine to Boulder Drive. That would allow driver trucks for Expresso to park on the side of the road and not interfere with traffic. This would help prevent the cracked sidewalks on a library site from the trucks who drive on it when backing into Expresso's driveway. This was suggested from the previous library director, Sharon Bernard. Okay, Councilman Van Hasinger. So um, from a planning perspective, I would oppose this amendment. Um, I, I think it's important to maintain our connectors between Main and Boulder Drive, that with the elimination of Cushion Street, that we're down to two. Um, and one of them is one way wood place, which is really just kind of goes through a parking lot. It's not really a, a real effective connector. Um, and it is worth pointing out that on Main Street opposite Espresso's is a loading zone that um, any delivery driver can use without having to, to pull into the parking lot at the, the establishment. Anybody else want to make a comment on it? I agree with that. Deep Commissioner deep Erickson? I, I agree with Councillor Van Hasinga, and I'd also like to add that the um, library is undergoing a design for complete renovation. And one of the things that they had considered was making Newton Place one way with angled parking. Um, and that was um, basically, for lack of a better term, frowned upon um, just because of the angled parking back you know, right into traffic. Um, and I, I don't think that that's going to be taken into consideration with further iterations of that design, um, just based on the feedback received um, on that proposal. We move to give seven leave to withdraw. Leave to withdraw. The parking on Newton Place Second. would be problematic too. It's a pretty narrow road. Mm -hmm. uh, Second. 
So vote on that. Yeah, we to withdraw. I seconded it. Okay, yes, yes. Yes, Leave everybody leads the draw. Okay, number seven. Number eight is replacement of missing light pole at Blossom Street and Main Street should be prioritized for pedestrian safety. So that's okay. That's not really a amendment, but so this it, it is a priority. Um, it was an old concrete pole that started to deteriorate. Chunks of concrete were falling down on the sidewalk. We had to take it out because it was a safety issue. Um, we've worked through the con we've worked through our contract. We've got our contractor on board. We've ordered poles. Now we're just waiting for, for them to come in. We're right up against the November 15th cutoff for excavating in the streets. Um, so depending on when that pole comes in, we might be able to squeeze it in and it might have to wait till next spring. So it, it remains to be seen. But we're experiencing unprecedented back orders on all street light supplies right now and it's, it's, it's crazy. Okay, so, so we'll take that under unanimous consent unless there's an issue. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, number nine lengthen the light timing at academy street in maine and mechanic in maine 10 to 12 seconds is barely enough time for a fully mobile adult or fully mobile school students provided they haven't been cut off by a driver ignoring the lights or their right of way anyone with the slightest mobility issue will only make it halfway before the crossing light ends this was from the community as well and i believe that she meant the pedestrian light timing okay. so one thing to note is that at academy maine and rollstone and at Mechanic in Maine, we've um, recently performed some, some repairs there. Um, so we've replaced the camera at Rollstone in Maine. We've made sure that the connection between the Mechanic in Maine and Academy in Maine in intersections are working. Um, and we've fixed a, a few other wiring issues out there. So um, you should see significant improvements throughout that corridor, including with the pedestrian signals. Um, 10 to 12 seconds is a, a pretty standard amount of time for a pedestrian to cross a road. Um, just to compare down, um, what was the example you gave? It was day in uh, Main Street. A day in Main Street, um, that's four lanes of traffic, an equivalent 10 to 12 seconds. Um, so I would, I would um, recommend waiting to see if the improvements that we made, repairs that we made suffice, and if not, we can um, take this back up again and retime the, the pedestrian signal. Okay, move to give nine, leave to withdraw. Leave to withdraw, okay. Second. Second. Unanimous on leave to withdraw? Yes. Okay. And the last uh, <clears throat> amendment is number 10, add street sign at Boulder Drive headed westbound on Main Street. Many people are not using Boulder Drive. Perhaps been a signage indicating left turn to Boulder Drive would help. C Commissioner Erickson. Would you I would agree with this. Um, so the Boulder Drive sign is after you get down the intersection and kind of round the bend right across from Montori's. I think the issue is that where the sign should be up near Main Street used to be called Boyle Court. Since that's been or is going to be discontinued and kind of absorbed into Boulder Drive, it makes sense to take that sign from where it is and move it up to where Boyle you Court sign. You said Boyle be. Court. I thought Boyle Court was. Sorry, Depot Court, not Depot. Boyle Court. Okay. Depot Court. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I agree with moving the sign. Okay, let's take a move to approve. Both. Second. Second. And uh, we'll take that under unanimous consent as well, since we're running out of time. And the okay, so we've got uh, health petitions uh, for review. Uh, Commissioner Erickson, I guess we could, in the interest of time, if uh, you've got any updates on any of them, otherwise we'll, we'll continue, to continue to hold them. So I've received draft reports. I have not had an opportunity to review them and go through them with the engineer. Um, so I would um, recommend holding these until the next meeting, at which point we should have um, enough to discuss and Move vote. to hold all held petitions for review. One second. question. We have a, one question. a quick question. Quick question. How much does it cost every time we have a, a traffic study? It depends. Um, these two that you see here were, um, I think, seven and eleven thousand dollars respectively. Seven and eleven thousand. They told up to be just under twenty thousand. Correct. Um, so, and just point of clarification, C and D on the agenda were those two traffic studies. Items E and F we were holding uh, pending results from the uh, public safety committee. So I'd recommend holding those until those results come back. Okay. We have a motion second to hold them all. To hold them all. We have a unanimous consent on holding? Yes. Okay. 
And do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. So moved. We're adjourned.